the theory in between the, t the, t the two argued theories that you will hear about in mainstream, which is creationism and Darwinism. This, the, and Lloyd written, wrote this book in 98 called Everything You Know Is Wrong. That's right, Richard. I mean, you know, he, he rightly points out, for example, that in the mainstream, they started off with the theory, theory of evolution where you've got this idea that, you know, we're all, as I've said to you in previous conversations, we are all slime plus time. You know, we, we started off as a, a form of slime that then over millions and hundreds and thousands of millions of years, we've evolved into Homo sapiens just naturally with nothing, you know, it's just a sort of chemical and biological process that happens naturally after a planet's formed mm -hmm. and that's all there is to it. But then th th this idea of one species changing into another, like, you know, fish, uh, growing leads and, and walking out of water. If you try and trace that, you, you can only find certain points in that journey. You can't find a continuous you know, line. There's always jumps in that. And, yeah. and, and, and the mainstream have now acknowledged that. They acknowledge that. I mean, even when I was in my teens, yeah. with, with, they call it punctuated equilibrium. Right. That, is, that is the name that's used in mainstream to try and say, oh, yes, you know, that's the name mm. for this observation. You know, a chimp hasn't turned into a human being, but we, we can look at chimps. We can see they're very close to human beings. Therefore, human beings must have evolved from chimpanzees. That's the kind of way that it works in the mainstream. Right. The, there's the whole question of... of, of how man in his current form, Cro-Magnon, some people call it, uh, came to be. What was it? it, it just a, a very gradual change from an earlier hominid, or was there a sudden change right. either through hybridization process or genetic engineering process, which Lloyd Pye That's what he discusses here. Yeah, absolutely. But then in his other book, he goes right the way back to four billion years to the to how the earth itself evolved and that there was possibly intervention, as he calls it, intervention, that, it, that yes. it wasn't a process left to its own devices. There must have been an external influence which created the atmosphere and then this and then so on. So, yes. so yes. your creationists say, well, you're talking about God, Richard, aren't you? That's right. But he wasn't That's talking right. about no, he wasn't. God in that sense, was he? Uh, but he has, you know, he has explored some of the similar territory to the creationists and he's had some of the same sorts of arguments with the Darwinists as the creationists have. So he, he shares some common sort of uh, statements with them, but it's not, he's not talking about creationism. Well, the, the book is divided into four parts, as we talked about last time. In part one, I go over Darwinism mostly, not so much creationism. If you believe, you believe. It's, uh, you're not subject to argument very much if you're a creationist. So I, I go after what the Darwinists say, and I show how that, in fact, they don't explain either how life came to be here or how particularly we came to be here. The evidence that they have is contingent on something called macroevolution, which is species into species. There's really no evidence for that. The creationists do make that argument, and I think they make it uh, accurately. There is absolutely no evidence anywhere of true macroevolution, species into species. We have changing body parts, which is called microevolution. Darwinists take the microevolution and they extrapolate. They say, well, if you can have change in parts, you can have changes in the whole bodies. That's what Darwin himself said. Actually, the the truth of it is, though it seems logical, it's not borne out anywhere in the record. Um, but yeah, th this, this, this is the original book, Everything You Know Is Wrong, and it's very hard to get hold of copies of this now, and I think they're, they're sort of running, for, you know, going for quite high prices on Amazon, e eBay and places. Um, and this does cover some of the earlier bits of evolution, but it, like as Richard was saying, it's more focused on the homin hominids and hominoids and by hominid, we mean something that's bipedal. You know, it, it's sort of superficially human looking. It primarily walks on two legs, but it's not in the acknowledged evolutionary line back to primates, you know, which allegedly evolved into humans, according to the mainstream. So hominid is a separate branch of humans, and they, they, they claim that there are these separate branches based on various criteria, some of which are discussed in this book. Mm -hmm. Um, so what's happened recently and why I wanted to bring this up in relation to the schools and everything is that I was very recently contacted by Amy Vickers um, because she has been working on, on this book for oh, two or three years, which is an updated version of Everything You Know Is Wrong, and she's given it the title of Everything You Know Is Still Wrong, which I rather like. And so 
This will be becoming available in uh, aug about August, so it's not available yet. August 2017, we're recording in July 17, 2017. So um, this has a lot of information about an alternative story about how we got to be as we are today. Uh, and as we've just discussed there, some of the issues about chimpanzees and the genetics of chimpanzees. And it also talks about the Bigfoot mystery. Mm -hmm. Bigfoot is an example of a hominid. Bigfoot isn't a type of human, but it is. it sort of looks human because it's bipedal. It appears to be intelligent. It has hair all over its body. So it appears to be a type of ape, but it's not a type of ape. It's different to an ape because apes and chimpanzees don't regularly walk on two legs, whereas Bigfoot does. So Lloyd goes into all of that in this book, um, and Amy has put this together following Lloyd's death because there was various draft, draft copies of notes that he'd been working on, and she decided to take it upon herself to uh, produce this new edition. So I just wanted to recommend that as a, a good read for people mm -hmm. who want to get a hold of it um, and find out some of the lies we've been told about our evolution or mm -hmm. lack of evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and. Just to finish by saying that in all of these areas, Andrew, with, with regards to the skull and with regards to everything you know is wrong, we have not had time to put forward 1% of all of the information mm. in this short interview. Right? If you're going to sit there and refute what we're talking about, you need to read the book or you need to watch the lectures by Lloyd Pye before you come to an opinion. Because if you come to an opinion just watching this interview, it's an ill-informed opinion. Absolutely. And don't write it off until you've actually studied the information. Yes. Because yes. it will make you think. A absolutely. And uh, there, are, there are a number of lectures given by Lloyd. Uh, and there is also his website, lloydpie.com. He's got some essays on there. That is in the process of being updated and revised because there's a few broken links on there and stuff. So, yeah. So review the information first before you criticise it. you know, yeah. Don't just, just assume that it must be nonsense because you've never heard anything about it. Okay, and you haven't got your hands on the on any piece of the original skull then? No, i Lloyd not. didn't cut a few bits off ju just no. in case? Or, or no, because the, the, the skull belongs to Melanie Young and mm. so she, he, it's always been in her possession. Mm. And curiously in this interview, going back to the interview, she tried to sort of make... Um, you know, she, uh, she, she tried to make inferences that Lloyd had stolen it from her, when that is not true. It's, it was, he, she gave it to him, you know, so. Right. And he, he gave it back to her as well in, in about 2003, I think she was given, given the school right. back, so. So one thing that would possibly settle the argument is if, if, the, D if the DNA sequencing company, because he kept that quiet because they, would only do the sequencing if he didn't reveal the, the guy's name who was helping him and the name of the company because they didn't want to be attached to such research. Correct. So if we can find the name of that person who did the sequencing on the Fox and found out about the Fox P2 gene, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other data other than just the Fox P2 right, gene, right? right? But that, that would be a piece of evidence. It would be very strong evidence if they could bring that forward publicly and you know, yeah. and, and write that up in a scientific paper and get it published in a journal yeah. you know, with all the names of the people involved. That would be right. ideal. Yeah. Whether that will happen, you know, I think the likelihood of that happening uh, is, is quite low at the moment. But um, who knows? Maybe, maybe we would see something like that um, if if the researcher involved wanted to go that route. It would depend probably on his personal circumstances and how important he felt this was to to put put that on you know that right. sort of information out. Okay, all right. And if there's any developments on this, you'll let everyone know. Yes, absolutely. You can keep an eye on Lloyd Pye's website, starchildproject.com. Um, you could even go and look at Melanie Young's website if you really want to. Um, and, of course, uh, I'm sure there'll be something that pops up on Rich Planet right. or on my website, checktheevidence.com. So. Right. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much. Coming up next is a section from my recent lecture covering new research regarding the alleged secret UFO tracking facility on the Brecon Beacons in South Wales. You might want to watch this film first to get some background. Right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my film UFOs and NATO now. This is a very dark film. And I'll just quickly summarize it for those of you who haven't seen it. I produced this in 2014. 
1997, a military guy came forward and gave some information to UFO researcher Derek Goff. And he told him that he'd been working in a black ops um, unit called Find and Secure. So this guy would be, um, he would be sent to another country in a jet and they would be then given a helicopter and they would be on standby. And this, this other part of NATO would be targeting UFOs. So anything that came down to the ground, whether it would be some wreckage from a craft or whatever, they would, their job was to go out in the helicopter and then seal off all of that evidence and stay there, camped out on the ground, until another American team came in to collect up all the evidence and then take it away. And she said that sometimes they would be camped out in a remote location for up to five days, people in this unit. And he said in his tour of duty, he witnessed many, many UFOs, and he also witnessed between 35 and 40 mutilated human beings, human beings mutilated in exactly the same way that we see animal mutilation cases linked to UFOs. Incredible claims. Uh, now, one of the interesting things that Derek Goff asked him was, well, hang on, you're, you're sent out to another country, which could take a while to get there, and then there's engagement with UFOs. He said, yeah. He said, well, how do they know the UFOs are going to be there? And his answer was, he didn't know, but they have foreknowledge. Uh, and I asked him the same question, and he'd give me the same answer, because the film follows my quest to meet this guy, and I've met him six or seven times now, but he's, he's now gone quiet on me. I've been trying to contact him because of some new information that I've got, but he hasn't been replying. But he gave me the same answer. I don't know, but they do. They know where these UFOs are going to be. Now, I've been puzzling over that. How the hell would NATO know where, where and when a UFO is going to appear so that they can target it? Now, you might have seen uh, on a recent Rich Planet show, I featured this guy, Lee Martin. Now, he had a UFO sighting in the 1970s. Um, now, there was a, he's a miner from, uh, well, not far from here, uh, from, he lived in uh, Vokru at the time he had the sighting. Um, now, there was another miner featured on the Rich Planet show, uh, who gave me an envelope. You might remember it. He actually gave me an envelope in this room. But I suspect now, I'm afraid to say, I suspect, I don't know, that that guy fabricated his account with the other miners in order to take the piss out of Lee Martin. And they've been pulling his leg for over 30 years about it, right? <coughs> um, but I do believe that Lee Martin's sighting is a genuine sighting, okay? So this is where he um, saw the UFO, so he was walking along this road here in Vokru, uh, where there's this mountain um, which overshadows the village. And he said a light came over. He thought it was a cloud initially, but it moved really, really fast. And then it, it came down and it landed on top of this hill. So I've done an artist's impression. He said it looked like an old-fashioned carriage clock. Now, when I put out information about this UFO sighting, I was contacted by another guy from the area. Let me just show you this map first. Lee Martin was walking down this road here in the early hours of the morning. He saw the thing land about there, okay? Now, I was contacted by a chap from this village here, Pont Lottin, and he said, well, I've got video footage of a UFO from 2007, 10 years ago. Would you like to see it? So I went to see him. He's in the audience tonight, and he showed me the footage. So... He notices this object hovering above his washing line in the western sky, and it sat there for over an hour, and it only moved slightly. I've checked all of the different angles that he was filming it from, and it's maybe moved a, a few degrees throughout the whole time it was there. Now, I have checked the astronomical charts. This was filmed on the 3rd of March, 2007. I've checked that Venus was not in that part of the sky or any other um, bright objects were not there. So it's not a star or a planet. It's not a Chinese lantern because it was there for over an hour. It's not a helicopter. It's not a plane. He didn't know what it was. But he was massively intrigued by it that he sat for over 20 minutes filming it. And he was going from his bedroom to his garden and then to another part of his garden. And he was so intrigued by it, he jumped in his car and he started driving towards it. But as he was driving towards it, it then vanished very quickly. Now, when he's zooming in on this object, I'm not sure that this diamond effect when it looks like it's shimmering, I'm not sure if that is an accurate representation of the object or whether that's just due to the fact that the camera's not focusing correctly. But it was an anomalous light, and he didn't know what it was. So I went to his house, and 
um, I took some photographs from the bedroom window where he filmed it. So as you saw in the video there, the object is hovering mainly above this tree for over an hour. So I took this photograph, which you can see the tree is still there 10 years later. So I've identified the tree on Google Earth. This is the bedroom window here. This is the tree. So if we draw a line through the right-hand side of the tree and then extend that line onto the larger map, I've added two more lines in just for a little bit of error. We see that this is very close, possibly, to where Lee Martin had his sighting, which I find very interesting. Now then, I then had a look at an ordnance survey map. Um, this road here is this one, and this one coming down there is this one. So we see here on the map, Cairn, C-A-I-R-N, which is an ancient stone circle, right at the point where Lee Martin says he saw his UFO land, and possibly underneath the point um, where the chap from Pont Lotton filmed the footage that you've just seen. So I've looked up um, some details about this stone cairn. Apparently it's a denuded and robbed out ring cairn in the form of a circular platform about 14 metres in diameter and 0.4 metres high. Partly stony and partly grass covered. There is a possible curb visible on the south side. So I went up there, there's very little left of it. It wasn't even worth taking a photograph of it, right? Now it states here, religious, ritual and funerary, right? The archaeologists do not know that, right? They rarely find bones at these sites. They're just guessing by saying it's religious or ritual, right? <clears throat> and notice it's quite large, 14 metres in diameter. It's quite a large stone circle. Now, I got talking to Andrew Johnson about the subject of stone circles and we had different opinions on it. And um, we may well do a show on what the true purpose of stone circles are. Because people say, oh, they're for keeping sheep in, or they were buildings, or they were for praying in, or whatever. But I, I really do think that for many stone circles, there's something a bit more to it. So Andrew pointed me to this book, Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. Let me just explain the premise of this book. In science books, when we see the Earth with its magnetic field, it's usually shown with a bar magnet running through it and the magnetic field lines coming out like this and going around the Earth, both sides of the Earth or all around the Earth. Now that's not strictly true because the side of the Earth which faces the Sun has a different shaped magnetic field to the dark side. So as the Earth rotates, when it goes from light into dark, the Earth's magnetic field changes. Any electrical engineer will tell you that if you have a changing magnetic field, uh, you will get electricity induced in anything that is in that vicinity. So uh, the Earth's crust has what are called telluric currents, which flow through the Earth, through the Earth's crust, because of the changing Earth's magnetic field. This is real science. You'll find it on Wikipedia. Uh, telluric currents, you can measure them, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, those currents, when they flow, they will flow according to the conductivity of the rock through the Earth. When you have an electric current set up, it will itself generate its own magnetic field. So you'll get a magnetic field going around it with the current going that way. That will then modify the Earth's magnetic field. So what happens is you get anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field during dawn and dusk at certain points on the Earth, according to what rock is there. Now, here's an example of one. So this is in the US. So this magnetic anomaly here in the Earth's magnetic field will occur for a certain period at certain times of the day. So a geomagnetic contour map of a Native American rock chamber in Kent Cliffs, New York, showing a negative magnetic anomaly right at the open doorway typical of such structures. This anomaly will electrify parts of the air as it enters the chamber. So what these researchers have done, they have been to hundreds of sites of stone circles and chambers, right? And they have found at many, many of these sites, they find these magnetic anomalies. They've built their stone chambers on magnetic anomalies, right? Now, the reason that they build their, uh, these stone chambers in these particular locations, according to the authors of this book, is that they would use them to make their seeds more fertile. So they would put the seeds in there, and as it says here, the anomaly will electrify parts of the air as it enters the chamber. Now, there is research being done which proves that you can affect a, a seed's... Um, how well a seed performs by using electricity or electromagnetism. You might say, well, hang on, we're talking 4,000 years old here for these structures. How the hell would they know 
that there's these magnetic anomalies appearing on the earth at certain times of the day. Well, the authors of this book claim that certain people are very electrosensitive. Some people are more sensitive to electromagnetism than others, and they would use these people to seek out these areas and build their stone chambers there in order to improve the yield of their seeds. And it's not just one or two chambers that they found this with. Many, many stone circles, they find these naturally occurring magnetic anomalies. And these magnetic anomalies will have been there probably for millions of years, occurring at certain times during the day. So we come back to our Vokro map, right? We've got possibly two cases with UFOs hovering over this area, and we've got a stone circle there. So if we go down the premise that that stone circle was put there because there's a magnetic anomaly there, and this is something on my list of things to do. I need to go up this hill and I need to take measurements at various points to see if there is a magnetic anomaly at certain times of the day. And do note, you saw there the UFO being filmed. It was at dusk when it was getting dark at the Terminator. And I think Lee Martin's sighting was at dawn, right? So <clears throat> let's just assume that, that this stone chamber was built because there's a magnetic anomaly there. What about the UFOs? The ancients knew about the magnetic anomalies, so they put their stone circles there. Perhaps the UFO also knows about the magnetic anomaly, but is using it for another reason, not for seeds. I don't know, maybe the aliens have got seeds in their, their UFO that they you know. But perhaps is it some sort of uh, getting energy from there, or is it a portal? I don't know, but is the UFO benefiting from some sort of magnetic anomaly? And the other thing that I haven't said yet is that the 3rd of March, 2007, when that UFO was hovering above that hill, is the night of a total lunar eclipse, right? So does um, the position of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon affect the magnetic anomalies? Does it en enhance them, perhaps, all right? Now, if you uh, consider what I've just explained, let's say someone maps out all of the best magnetic anomalies all around the planet. And perhaps on certain nights, they're much higher in energy, right? And that NATO know wh which ones the UFOs are going to appear at. So perhaps this explains how NATO have worked out how they have foreknowledge of UFO activity. So it's just a hypothesis, okay? But I'll, I'm going to go up that hill and take some measurements to see if we've got magnetic anomalies at dawn and dusk. <clears throat> okay, now let's come on to this film now because I have got some new information that I'm going to go through. Um, as I said, this guy worked in this special unit, and he told Derek Goff and myself about various different cases. This is a representation of two bodies that were found on the Brecon Beacons. So what's alleged to have happened is that a vehicle uh, was parked in a, in a lay-by in a place called Clambetta, not far from Krakowell. A young couple were abducted from the vehicle in their seats, so when the military found the car, there were no front seats in there with the lights were on and the engine was running. So the military took the vehicle away, they took samples, uh, and then they started a, a search, which took two weeks, two weeks before the bodies were found and they were found just south of Taliban Reservoir, right? But the military bagged them and then that was all covered up and they had the classic mutilation injuries. Okay, here's uh, some of Derek Goff's notes from 1997. We see here, the, the military went to the car, the engine was running, there was uh, no one there, there was no seats in the front. They took the car away and they took samples from the ground. Uh, two weeks later, three kilometers away from where the car was found, uh, two bodies, blah, blah, blah. Now, I've since found out, um, by the way, this is news articles that I have um, correlated with this case. And this has allowed me to determine the probable date of when this happened. So, yeah, I've, I've since had new information that um, the bodies were actually south of, just south of Taliban Reservoir, which is 13 kilometers where the car was found. Now, the reason why I'm explaining all this is because of the date. So the bodies were, the, the couple were abducted on the 20th of August, 1990, according to the military source. So two weeks after that is the 3rd of September. 3rd of September, 1990, is when these bodies were found up there on the Brecon Beacons. And, and there have allegedly been more than just this case on the Brecon Beacons. Now in the film, the military guy explains that this military facility is used for UFO tracking and possibly for UFO targeting. 
So this is five miles northwest of Sunnybridge. You can find it on Google Earth, right? You see here there are trees being built which prevent you from seeing in there. This is, you can drive along this road. It is a military road, but the public are allowed along there, but you're not meant to stop your car. Now, there's a concreted area in this facility here, and there's four posts uh, in the corner, which our military source claims as part of this weapon. He also says that there's a radar dish, I don't know where in the facility, that comes up from, un from underneath the ground at night, and it rotates, a bit like an airport radar, and that's, that, that finds where the UFO is, and that there's some weapon system, non-ballistic, that can actually target the UFO and cause it to come down to the ground. Incredible claims. So the research that I've been involved with over the last few months is to try and verify these claims about this, uh, about this military facility. So I've tr attempted to find out what its true purpose is. So this is the first article I've been able to find, um, which is an article from before this facility was built. This is in the western fringes of Munnard Ebbent, it's called. So this is Breckman Radnor Express, Thursday the 29th of November 1990. So this is just eight weeks after when the bodies were found. Secret plans to site huge radar masts on Ebbent Hills. So this is talking about proposals to build that military facility that our source claims is a UFO-related facility. MP drops bombshell. MP for Brecknan and Radnor, Richard Livesey, dropped a bombshell this week with the disclosure that the Ministry of Defence is secretly planning to site a massive naval communication system on the western fringes of Munnard Ebbent. It was uh, on Tuesday that the Welsh Liberal Democrat leader revealed that up to four skyscraper mas radar masts some 1,500 feet above ground level are to be built on the Sennybridge military ranges as part of an intelligence network for the Trident nuclear submarine fleet. So only this one MP was given out this information. So he had a source, probably in the MOD, that had told him that they were going to build this facility. But they told him that it was just a Trident communication system. So in other words... It's nothing to do with UFOs, it's a communication system for Trident. Now this MP is quite annoyed in this article and he's saying, well, why are you building a Navy communication system up on the Brecon military ranges, army ranges? Why don't you build it near the ocean or near the sea on Navy land? And these masts are 1,500 feet high, four masts, that's what they're proposing to build in this article. So this is Richard Livesey here who got this information somehow um, unfortunately, he died in 2010, so it would have been really good to speak to him, but we can't do that, unfortunately. So, um, so we've got a, a news article appeared on the 20th of uh, December 1990 titled Authenticity of Radar Masks Plan Challenged. So there's other MPs who are criticizing Richard Livesey, saying, no, he's talking rubbish. They're not, they're not secretly planning to build anything on, on these army rangers. One of his political opponents has challenged the claim made by Breton and Radnor MP Richard Livesey that the Ministry of Defence is secretly planning to site a massive naval communication system on the western fringes of the Sennybridge army rangers. This week, the prospective Conservative candidate Jonathan Evans stated that he had received an assurance from the Secretary of State for Wales, David Hunt, there is no such proposals uh, on Munnard Evans, right? So the Secretary of State for Wales hasn't even been told, a member of the government. So this tells you that Richard Livesey had secret information. Okay, not about building a UFO tracking facility, but about building some Trident communication system. So Richard Livesey then starts making a bit of a nuisance of himself. On the 10th of January 1991, Minister fails to allay fears over a mass. So he starts asking questions in Parliament whether the MOD or the Secretary of State for Defence has changed his plans to site naval radar radio masts on Her Majesty's land on the Senny Bridge range in the Breton and Radnor. So he's then given a reply. A requirement for new defence communication facilities is under consideration, but no decision on location have yet been taken. So they are now admitting that they might be building one somewhere. So then two months later, the MOD comes clean at last over Epping Range masts. So this is the 14th of March, 1991. The government admit, yes, we are going to build something at that facility. It's official. The Ministry of Defence is considering the Sennybridge military rangers as a site for four massive communication masts as part of a NATO intelligence network for the Trident submarine fleet. Isn't that interesting? We've got that word NATO, which is the title of my film, UFOs and NATO. Okay, so... Um, 
Now, let me just explain what these proposed masts look like. Uh, this is the uh, skyline of London. The tallest building in London is the Shard. It's 1,000 feet high. So if you were to put one of these uh, radar masts next to it, that's what it would look like. So you could see why the MPs and the local council are getting annoyed that they're going to put four of these masts in an area of outstanding uh, natural beauty there on the Brecon Beacons. Now, let me just also explain the reason why they need to be this tall is because they have, it's a VLF station, very low frequency. You need huge masts to transmit low frequency radio waves. The reason why they need to be so low frequency is so that they can penetrate through the ocean to speak to a submarine, right? This is a one-way communication system. The submarine can't send any inf information back, right? But there are several of these VLF transmission stations around the world, and they all have these extremely high masts. So here's an example one in Western Australia. These masts are 1,270 feet high. This station runs at 19.8 kilohertz. They have to be this size, but very low frequency, because normal radio waves don't, won't travel through the ocean. They've got to be low frequency. This is a photograph of that facility during the day. You can see the masts. You can see this one is built next to the ocean, and nearly all of them are built next to the ocean. This is a diagram of one. Here's one in the UK. This one has 13 masts, 745 feet. It's in Cumbria. This runs at 19.6 kilohertz. As you can see, built near the sea. This is one in Germany, 1,157 feet high masts. You'll, you'll understand why I'm telling you this in a second. Now, if you go on the website smeter.net, you will find many of the world's VLF stations uh, listed. Now, I've been through this entire list and Googled all of them and trying to get photographs of each one. Every single one of them, 1,000 foot masts, right? You can't communicate with a submarine unless you've got huge transmission masts. So on the 28th of March, 1991, this article is just all about how the council are going to oppose these plans and they're, they're making it awkward. Um, and a very interesting article pops up six months later. Sensitive material missing after raid on MP's office. So this is Richard Livesey, the guy who somehow had information on this, this facility before he should have. Questions were being raised this week whether a weekend burglary at the constituency offices in Brecon of Liberal Democrat MP Richard Livesey was politically motivated. Describing the break-in as sinister, Mr. Livesey revealed this week that £6,000 worth of computer equipment stolen in the raid contained sensitive material. He believed the intruders, who did a very professional job in gaining access to the premises, considered to be very secure, were carrying out a special mission. The thieves were not a bunch of amateurs, but knew uh, what they were looking for, said Brecon and Radnor, Member of Parliament. So was someone, perhaps connected to the MOD, breaking into his office to find out how the hell, who is his source, where we have this leak from, and possibly, does he know more? Does he know more about the purpose of this facility? Okay, and here it is. So as I said, the f these four posts are on the corner of this concreted area. Now I'm just going to show you some Orden survey maps which show that the, that the posts or the, or the masts were put up in the 1990s. Um, here's a photograph that I took of them. This is just present day. Right, this is a present day Orden survey map and you can see these are the trees that you saw on the other image. That's the concreted area where the posts are, or the masts. Now here's a more detailed Orden survey and the four masts are marked by these four dots. As I say, that's present day. We go back to 1989 Orden survey you see they've actually got the facility prepared, but there's no detail of the masts. 1996, still no detail of the masts. If we go to 1998, we see that the concreted area is there, but no masts. 1999, we have masts. So the first appearance of the masts on Orden survey is in 1999. Now that doesn't mean they were put up in 1999. It means they were put up at least in 1999. So this facility was constructed with the masts in the 1990s. So I think what I'm, the reason why I'm presenting this is to show you that they are talking about the same facility. And that facility is on the western fringes of the Munnard Eben range. So they are talking about the facility. And this is a photograph that I've taken. Uh, you don't hang around too long when you there. So here's, here's a, another image. So you can see that to, the masts are actually connected with wires. This is a CCTV system. 
Here's an aerial view from Google Earth. So you can see the, you can see the four masts cast in shadows here. Here's another photograph that I've taken. Again, you can see wires connecting two of the, aerial, two of the well, I'll not call them aerials, two of the masts. <coughs> um, now here's um, a close-up of the base, the bases, which are extremely robust if these are just transmitters. Now, you'll notice on this Google Earth image, there's a scale here, 10 meters. So I'm able to work out the distance between the masts. And now that I know the distance between the masts, the masts using this photograph, I've worked out the height of the masts, okay? So I've now produced an isometric engineering drawing of one of these masts. Here it is. They're 44 feet high. There's no way that this is a transmitter for a trident communication system. I cannot speak to a submarine, right? If, and I'm not convinced that these are even uh, transmitters. They're some sort of mast, but I'm not convinced it is an aerial. But let's say it was an aerial used in what's called quarter wavelength mode, which is a common mode. Um, you calculate the frequency at around about 5.5 megahertz, which is the low end of the HF band. There's no way that that signal could penetrate through the ocean to a submarine. <clears throat> um, now, a friend of mine is on a radio comms forum on the internet, and I gave him some of this information with photographs of the masts, and he posted it on a, on a radio buffs forum just to get their opinions on what this might be. The first guy said, oh, they're lightning conductors. Then another guy said, no, they're radio beacons. Someone else chips in, they're long-range artillery comms antennas for field army training. Then another guy says, they're multi-directional aircraft tracking. No, no, another guy says, it's HERTAS, which jam aircraft locating finding equipment. Apparently, someone said, it's known by some as the telephone exchange. Then another guy pops up and he says, no, no, you're all wrong. It's a NATO Trident communication uh, submarine system. And he then posts a link to one of Richard Livesey's parliamentary questions with the MOD's answer, confirming that it is a Trident communication system. So everyone on the radio forum then says, oh, well, that's it. And then they start talking about something else. We've solved that one. It's just for Trident. And they all agreed, right? But I can tell you that it, 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 it can't be. It can't be. In my opinion, the government have lied about what they're going to build. Now, just forget the whole subject of UFOs for a second. That in itself is worthy of note. That The government have told everyone that they're going to build uh, 1,500 feet high transmitters for, for their nuclear trident program, and what they've built is this. I don't know what it is, right? It's 44 feet high. It's not, that cannot communicate with trident, right? So, you know, it's, it's built on army land on top of a hill. It's not near the ocean like most of these VLF transmission stations are. So it is something completely different in my opinion. And I, and I, and I do think this proves that the government have lied. And here's how the four are laid out. So what could it be? Now you saw that there was uh, wires connecting some of them, and it is possible to have what's called a wire antenna. So you will have two posts, sometimes you attach it to a building, and the wire itself is the antenna. So in this case, the wire would be about 40 meters long. So even if that was used in quarter wavelength mode, you're talking 1.87 megahertz. It is slightly lower frequency, but not much. Uh, some people have said, oh, well, they're used as 12th or 16th wavelength, right? No matter, no matter which way you look at it, it's not a tried communication system. It's nowhere near big enough. It's nowhere, so it's something else, in my opinion. So what could it be? I've had a few thoughts on it. Um, one suggestion is that it might be a phased array. If you have a, a single transmitter and you apply frequency to it, the energy will dissipate outwards like this. If you have two, three, four, or multiple transmitters and you apply the same frequency, it would phase shift them so they're slightly out of sync. If you do it right, uh, you can create a beam. It's not, so the energy doesn't dissipate in all directions. And you can focus that beam. You can point it at an area in the sky and focus it. So this is what HARP is. It's a phased array. So is this a phased array? I don't know. Like I say, I'm not even convinced that these are radio transmitters. They look far too robust to just be normal antennas. So we see that there's wires attached to them. Is it the case that those wires are used to suspend something which we don't see? Something which is not there, which perhaps they bring out at night? I don't know. Um, so is it a directed energy weapon? Is this what's used to target UFOs, to interfere with their propulsion system, to bring them down to the ground? Which is what our military source said. Um, 
Now, another theory is maybe they are what's called um, uh, waveguides. So <clears throat> a waveguide is like a metal tube that you fire microwaves down. So if, the, if they were waveguides, then you're talking much higher frequencies and you'd have some sort of magnetron maybe under the ground. I'm just hypothesizing here. I do not know what this facility is, but I'm putting out the information so the technical people can watch this and then tell me what this is. I'm not going to jump in with both feet and say, look, I told you this is what they're shooting UFOs down with because I don't know that it is. But this is what our military source said, and it's not a trident communication system. Okay, as I said, these might not be aerials. There could be supports for something else. And they do run, uh, they have been running GPS jamming exercises up there. So this, between the 15th and 26th of August, what they've done, they install us some equipment, which is just 2.3 miles from this facility. And what this does is it stops GPS systems from working, like if you've got a drone or whatever. But I've been told that the reason why they do this is when the troops are on exercises and they're doing map reading or whatever, some of them will cheat. They'll carry a GPS thing around with them so they can cheat. So they, they so the military jam GPS. So there's there's possibly a just a straightforward explanation why they've got jamming systems up there. So if anyone's got any information, please do forward it to me, and I'll be very interested to hear what you've got to say. Okay, now um, just to summarise and finish tonight's talk, some of this information is very confusing because you say, well, it looks like they faked certain of the moon landings. Uh, but Richard, in one of your previous talks, you, you were talking about the TR-3B, which is this incredible vehicle that can go really, really fast and go to other planets. So how, how, does, how does that match with the, the moon landings being faked? And, the, and also the Mars rover missions being faked? Because in a previous Rich Planet show, we've suggested that some of the lunar and Mars orbiters may have filmed ruins on the surface. So Cydonia on Mars. We've also got the testimony of Carl Wolf, who said that there was, there was ruins or, or, or buildings on the far side of the moon. So how does it all hang together? We've also got the UFO mystery, which is still very much a mystery. Now, in order to try and attempt to explain all of this evidence, I'm going to throw in another theory, which is called the constraints of Gaia. Anyone heard of this? Constraints of uh, Gaia theory states that um, all life on Earth is in some way connected to the Earth. We're all part of the Earth, either electromagnetically or through some other means, and that if you leave the Earth, after you get past a certain distance, you will cease to be. You cannot go further than a certain distance. You will lose your marbles, or your heart will stop, or what have you. That there's some sort of constraint that is a, some sort of physical or electromagnetic constraint within all life on the Earth. We're part of the planet. That's the theory of the constraints of Gaia. The theory goes that NASA um, discovered this in their space missions as they got further away from the Earth, and they've been working on how to get around it. So they need to build a, a simulator to simulate the Earth, to take with them, perhaps. So I'm going to summarize, and I'm going to give you a hypothesis. This is just a hypothesis, and it might completely change next year if I get new evidence. But um, here's my stab at it. I've updated the hypothesis since I've given this lecture, so I'll give you the up-to-date one. Advanced propulsion craft have been developed by man in secret and are being used on and around the Earth in secret up to a certain orbital height, i.e. within low Earth orbit. Space-based weapons such as observed on 9-11 have also been developed. All this technology is classified.